So Donald Trump, I'm glad you find it funny. Not everybody does. Decides to campaign and try to get the Floridian vote. So he travels to Miami, and of course, the first place to visit is a Jewish old age home, a home for assistant living. Here he will begin his campaign trail to convince at least the Jews of Florida that he is the man. He enters into this home, the old age home, and he meets a 101-year-old Jewish woman. He says, hello. She says, hi, my dear. He says, do you recognize me? She says, no, my bubala. <laughs> he says, do you know my name? She says, absolutely not, but you can tell it to me. He says, you don't know who I am? My hairdo? My blondness? My charm? My charisma? My personality? My fame? Everybody in the world knows me. She says, I don't. I'm sorry, my ingala, but I don't know. He is beside himself. He's like, I cannot believe you don't know who I am. Tell me right now you know who I am. Another woman, a few decades younger, approaches him and says, relax, relax. Don't stress out. This happens often around here. I will call the woman from the front desk. She will tell you who you are. Perhaps the most important question in life is, who am I? Maybe you know who I am. Do I know who am I? Who I am? And I don't know if there was another nation who so deeply struggled to answer this question as the Jewish people. Proof? Ask 17 million Jews the definition of Jewish identity, you will get 17 million answers. What does it mean to be a Jew? Who am I? There's the old saying, why is it that when two Jews greet each other, in the language of our Holy Fathers, Lashon HaKodesh Hebrew, I say to you, Shalom Aleichem, peace unto you. And the response is, Aleichem, Shalom, unto you, peace. Why not reciprocal? Imagine I tell you, Good morning, and you say morning good. Good evening, evening good. How are you? You are how? You would say this guy needs some serious help. And yet in Hebrew, nobody blinks. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. The answer of course is when two Jews meet, even before anything, they first have to get into an argument. And therefore I say to you, Shalom Aleichem, and all you can say is stop hacking a chinik, that's ridiculous, that's absurd, it's exactly the opposite way around. Aleichem Shalom. Now that we have established that we argued, we can perhaps have a more peaceful conversation. Who are we? Well, I am thrilled to be, for the second time now, part of the thundering response of the South African Jewish community to the question, who are we as Jews? Because probably the best answer ever given to that question was phrased by the 8th century Babylonian giant and gone, Rabbi Sa'ad Yagon, who in one of the first philosophical works of Judaism called Emunot Vedeot, faiths and opinions, faiths and perceptions, beliefs, asked the question, what is it really that binds the Jewish people that connects one Jew to another. For most of our history, sadly, we were exiled from our dear beloved homeland. What is it that connected a Jew from Aleppo to a Jew from Moscow, a Jew from Brazil to a Jew from Jerusalem, a Jew, a Jew from Portugal to a Jew from Morocco, a Jew from Los Angeles to a Jew from Jerusalem? What was it ultimately that defined us as a people? 
And to quote Rabbeinu Sa'ad Yagon, Umateinu Einena Uma, Kiim Betoroteha. Our nation is not a nation only by virtue of its Torah. Today, South African jury responds to the thundering question, who am I? Who are we? By reiterating so many centuries later, more than a millennia later, under different circumstances, those words of Rapsad Yagon, Uma Seinu, Einenu Uma Ki Im Teha. You know there was once a Jew, he was a frail fellow, he lived in Johannesburg. He comes to Shul Shabbos morning, and the rabbi tells the Gabbai he deserves an Aliyah. Gabbai says, the Aliyah Sadon. The rabbi says, give him Hag, but let him lift up the Sefer Torah. It was a heavy Sefer Torah, one of those 747s. They call him up, Yamot, for Hagba. He approaches the Torah. He picks it up. Oh, my dear friends, Nebach. He's mamish, he's so frail. The Torah, Khalil, almost drops. A hundred people jump the bima and grab the Torah. It was the most embarrassing moment of his life. He never showed up in Shul again. Instead, he spent four days out of the week in the gym. He decided he's going to become the most muscular, robust, powerful, and forceful Jew. His muscles are going to be bulging out. Everybody will go, wow. And when he comes back to Shul a year later, and he does Hagba, he's going to lift up that Sefer Torah and do seven Hakafas around the Bimah. He's going to spread out the Sefer Torah from Bereshus to Vizol Sabrochi. You know those guys? It's not enough three pages. They're like a thousand pages. And he's going to start twirling like in a ballet. And he's going to show what he can do. Indeed, a year later, he shows up to Shul. He makes sure to wear a tight shirt. The muscles are mamish protruding. He's been bench pressing, you know, 450 pounds. Mamish Gavald. He comes there, and sure enough, Yamot! He runs up to the bim, goes over the same Torah, lifts it up, starts twirling around the shul, women's section, men's section. Around and around. With a great smile, he puts down, sits down, turns to the Gabbai and say, No, what do you say about my Hagba? Huh? Gabbai says it was wonderful, but we gave you Shlishi. And I share, <laughs> I share, I share this with you today because Reb Meir Shapiro, Zech Yitzhak Levrocha, was the founder of the Yeshivas Chachmi Leblin, founder of Daf Yoimi. He comes to the United States in the 1920s to fundraise for his yeshiva, his new yeshiva in Lublin, his baby. He goes into a wealthy Jew and he asks for money. This was the first yeshiva in Poland to have its own kitchen, its own dormitory, its own library, unique. And the wealthy man says, I can't support you. Meir says, why? And this man says, because you are fighting and undermining a Mishnah in which tractate, Pirkei Avot. And by now, hopefully, you know it. The ethics of fathers teaches, Kachi Darkashal Torah, the path of Torah is Pat bemelach to pas bemelach tochel. Mayim bemesurah tishdal oritz tishon chayitz ar tichim ato oisakein ashrech v'toivlach. You know the path to success in Torah? You eat bread with salt. That's it. You drink a little bit of water. You sleep on the ground. You live a life devoid of any material prosperity. If you do so, you're fortunate in this world and the next world. Reb Meir Shapiro, you want to undermine the Mishnah. You want to build a beautiful yeshiva. Comfortable beds, good food. I can't help you. You like that? Rameir Shapiro says, my dear friend, when you read the Mishnah, it doesn't tell you the tune in which you have to read it. You're reading the words, you got the tune wrong. He says, what are you talking about? He says, let me read to you the Mishnah properly. Kahi darkushal Torah? Is this the right path for Torah? Pas b'melech toichel? You eat bread with salt. Feh. Mayim b'msura tishta. Alor, it's tishan chayitz artichya. 
This is how an Assyrian student of Torah ought to live. And then the Mishnah continues. Im ato If you narcissistic, selfish man, if you live that life, ashrech v'toivlach. For you it would be awesome. <laughs> but for the yeshiva boys, build them an infrastructure that they should be able to become leaders of Torah for the next generation. What is so moving about today is that kachi darka shal Torah, Chief Rabbi and the whole community have taken the learning of Torah, the spreading of Torah to a new level with such beauty, such grandeur, such prosperity, such technological acuteness and sensitivity. I still can't figure it out. I'm a little worse than Rabbi Goldstein. But I'm still impressed. This is Darka Shal because this is the answer to the question, who I am. And I have to tell you something. It's a little hard for me to believe a Jew from New York, a very wealthy Jew comes over to me, and he says, you know, I want to bring Jews together in New York to learn Torah. In New York, we have around 4 million Jews. So there's a few minyanim over there. He says, how do we bring Jews, like a lot of Jews from different circles, they never mingle, they never meet each other. I look at him, I say, why don't you learn from South Africa? <laughs> Go to South Africa and see they have a Mount Sinai experience every year. And then I thought to myself, how many Jews are here? 60,000? Le'erich, right? In New York, you have 4 million Jews. But the greatest initiatives for Torah today, for learning Torah, for the celebration of Shabbos, come from where? Let's face it. When the Ponovich Jerov used to come here to raise money 50, 60 years ago, he loved South African jury, but he certainly knew the struggle he and many Torah leaders faced. Today, a half a century later, you could say that from South African Jewish community, the light of Torah and the light of Shabbos spread literally to the whole world. Talk about, talk about smaller Jewish communities feeling insignificant in the presence of larger communities. It didn't come even from Israel and even from the United States of America and not even from Great Britain, but Mamish from the Chatsi Kadr Hatachten, the Southern Hemisphere from here. Such a renaissance, such unprecedented achdus, unity, of a call, of a hakel through Torah. And I have to address that third dictum. Asus yog Torah. Torah needs fences. Torah needs boundaries. Was it Robert Frost who said, good fences, good neighbors make? I think it was Frost. It's a good line. People need fences. People need boundaries. You know what the Kotsky Rebbe said? You got that? If you, you're going to be responsible to remember this. If I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, you are not you and I am not I. Because I am I only because you are you. So there's no I because my only I is based on you. But if I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you. Then I am I, and you are you. And now we can begin to schmooze. Now we can begin to have a relationship. People need boundaries. Anybody a little bit familiar with halacha? One of the most powerful ideas of halacha, I always tell this to my children. Any tractate in Mishnayas. Torah, the sages respected boundaries. All of Shabbat focuses on boundaries. There's my boundary, there's your boundary. It's healthy, it's good. Because if I know who I am, I have the space to know who you are and to create space for you without feeling choked or swallowed up. But you know what? Torah also needs boundaries. Judaism also has boundaries. Not everything goes. Who did we learn this from? One of the greatest, Jew one of the greatest women ever. She wasn't Jewish. She was a Moabite woman. Her name was Ruth. And in the first chapter, 
It's the only time in Jewish history that I know that a daughter-in-law voluntarily followed her mother-in-law. Naomi says, go get a life. She says, no, I want to be with you. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Naomi says, I'm an old lady. Why spend the rest of your life with your shviger? And Ruth tells her, Ruth, one, where you go, I go. Where you dwell, I dwell. Your people is my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I will die. And Rashi says right there that Naomi was giving her a lesson about the boundaries of Judaism. Tchum Shabbos, Taryag Mitzvahs. In detail, Rashi goes through from a Gemara, from the Talmud. But the question is, where do we create those boundaries? Where do we create the fences? There are the fences of halacha, but then there are the social fences. Who belongs in the umbrella of Torah? The umbrella of the Jewish people? A fence you must make. There is a boundary. There's something called the domain of Torah, a consciousness of Torah, a Jewish way of life, a Jewish sensitivity. Who is included? So the rabbis, some say, Vasu Sagla Torah means make a fence and make the fence as exclusive as possible. In my fence, nobody is allowed. Just me and the people that look like me and the people that agree with me. You know the t-shirt I'm very easy to get along with? Once you learn to worship me. But what the sages are saying is, you have to build that fence. But they just said a moment ago, many students, Hamidu Talmidim Harbe, we heard. They just said before that, be patient, be deliberate. And now make a fence, Asusiak. Make a fence, but make sure that that fence is not an exclusive one. It's a fence that includes Reach out and into every single Jew and show them that no matter what their opinion may be of themselves, their past, their upbringing, they have a space of dignity within the Choyma, within the 4,000 year fortress of Torah, of Yiddishkeit, of God's unconditional love to the people and of the destiny of the nation of eternity to revolutionize planet Earth. And make it a space of oneness, of kindness, of love, of profound morality and connectedness. One of the most frequent great sages of the last generation who would visit South Africa probably every year is known as the Ponovich Rav, I mentioned earlier, the rabbi of Ponovich of Lithuania. His name was Rabbi Yosef Shlomo Kahanman. Zeichert Tzadik Levrach. Why did he visit here? Because most of the community were Yoytse Lita, were Jews who came from Lithuania, and he probably married 40% of the couples back in Lithuania. He used to come here, and he loved the community. He once said, in his own inimitable style, I have to say this in Yiddish, and in, in the Litvish Yiddish, he says, Vibaldos in Litvish Yidin, these are Lithuanian Jews, they're going to come back to Torah. But he once said the following. When Jacob, Yaakov, in Genesis, arrives to Mesopotamia, to a city called Haran, northern Iraq, it's still an action-filled place today. Any place that the Bible mentions <laughs> never got boring in history. The Middle East, as they say, Israel is a great country, it's just in a pretty bad neighborhood. Yaakov comes to Haran, where do you go? You go to the well. At the well he sees a bunch of shepherds sitting and smoking and reading the newspaper and sipping latte. Playing cricket, whatever they were doing. So Yaakov turns to them and as a good Jew he says, who gave you permission to sit around here? Lo Yosef this is not time, this is the middle of the day. Your employees, go back to work. Now, I come from New York. 
Imagine I stop at a place of construction and I see that 1 o'clock p.m. the guys are sitting, they're drinking coke, they're eating tuna sandwiches, some hefty chevre who know how to do a hagba. And I get out of my car and I say, guys, guys, who gave you permission to sit around there and drink soda and check your iPhones? It's work. Get back to work. You know, what do you think they're going to tell me? If I come out alive <laughs> with all my bones, I'd be happy. Jacob comes. What would I tell him? I said, I don't know who you are. We've been here 65 years working for the unions. Don't come in and tell me what to do, go home, when, when. A chutzpah, get out of my life. Instead, the miracle of miracles, they all respond. They explain to him the issue. There's a huge rock. They can't irrigate their flock. They need to wait for all the shepherds to come to help them get the rock off. Yaakov says, I'll do it. The Panovich Yerov says, how did he get such a response? You know what his answer was? You know what his opening word when he met them was? Anybody? When he came to the well, his first words were, Achai, may I not. My brothers, where are you from? And that made all the difference. He didn't go over to the well and said, you lazy good-for-nothings. You manipulators, ganovim, gazlonim, shakronim. He went over to them. He didn't know them. He said, Achai, my brothers. You know what he did? He expanded his fence. My brothers, you're my brother. If you feel that I'm your brother, then I could feel that you're my brother. You could tell me anything. You could challenge me. You can elevate me. You can ask me tough questions. But I need you I need to know that you care, you're connected. That fence could be expanded. A fence there is! A commitment there is! Ah, my brothers! I always mention this man. Not Jewish, but he should always be remembered by the Jewish people as we say, Purim Vegam Charvoina Zachor Latov. Arturo. Toscanini. You remember Toscanini? Toscanini was one of the greatest musicians of the 19th and early 20th century. A world-renowned Italian conductor. He died in 1959. And why do we owe him a debt of gratitude? Because in the 1930s, Hitler fired every, almost every Jewish musician playing in Berlin, in Germany, and in Vienna. And you know that the Jewish skill for music at that time was extraordinary. Their contribution to music in Germany and Vienna was absolutely stupendous. Arturo Toscanini, who despised fascism and anti-Semitism, helped them all move to what was then called Palestine. And he is the one who founded the Palestine Symphony Orchestra, he directed it for the first few times, and because of his world-renowned influence, he cemented it, he turned it into a success story. The first symphony, the Palestine Symphony Orchestra played December 26, 1936. You couldn't get a seat in Tel Aviv. People were on the roofs and on the walls listening to the gorgeous music. Toscanini finished, and the symphony had received a 30-minute standing ovation. In 1948, its name was changed to the Israeli Israel Symphony Orchestra. Toscanini died in 59. But listen to this. He had a biographer who was writing his biography. And he once came to him one night and he said, I would like to talk to you, Toscanini. He said, tonight I'm busy. He says, what are you doing, maestro? He said, it's not for you. You can't be here. He said, why? What are you doing? He says, I used to conduct a symphony overseas, 600 miles away. They're having a symphony tonight. I'm not going to be there. There's another conductor, but I arranged that I should be able to hear it through shortwave radio. And then it was a big deal. He says, Maestro, can I be here while you listen 
to your symphony. For a biographer, such a thing would be priceless. He says, if you promise that you will not say a word. The symphony begins. Toscanini is listening to his symphony, being directed, conducted by somebody else overseas. Shortwave radio. The biographer is watching him. The symphony finishes. The biographer says, that was amazing. Toscanini says, not really. What was the problem, Maestro? Maestro says, the symphony has 120 musicians, including 15 violinists. Only 14 showed up. He thought the man is absolutely meshuggah. Through shortwave radio, he knew that 14 instead of 15 violins played. He was curious. The next morning, he called the director of music of that symphony. And he said, I have to ask you a question. How many musicians came last night? He said, there was supposed to be 120. One violinist didn't show up. We had 14 instead of 50. He goes back to Toscanini. He says, I have to apologize. I thought you lost it. But I have to ask you, how in the world did you know that a violin was missing? Toscanini looked at him and said, that is the difference between you and me. You are part of the audience. I am the conductor. I know every note. And I heard last night that not every note was played. I knew one violinist was absent. And I thought to myself, what a metaphor for the Jewish people. Make offense for Torah, but who belongs in that siyag? Who belongs in that boundary? From the audience's perspective, a note is missing, who notices? But from the conductor of the symphony, who created, conceived every note, every single note is indispensable, and not one single note can ever be excluded, because everybody has their unique music to play. And the music you bring to the Jewish people, to God's universe, has never been played before or after. It's your unique contribution, your note to the divine cosmic symphony embodied in Torah. But there's something else. There is something else about making a boundary, making a space. It's about making spaces. There was a great scholar who comes to a great Kabbalist, a tzaddik, in Jerusalem. And he says, teach me the greatest mysteries of Torah. I'm a great scholar, but I want to learn more. And he says, sure, come in. He comes in. He says, you want a cup of tea? Sure. He takes a cup, gives it to his guest, takes the hot kettle, the hot shinik, and starts pouring it into his cup. It comes to the top, and he continues pouring he says, Rabbi, stop, stop, stop. No, 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 more, 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 more. He's pouring and pouring. The poor guy was drenched. He says, stop. He says, no, 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 why should I stop? He says, the cup is full. No tea can go in. He says, that's your problem. Your cup. <laughs> your kepala, your cup is full. You don't have space for any new wisdom to come in. In order to truly be able to appreciate a new idea, in order to be able to internalize wisdom, never mind divine wisdom, I have to create a space, a safe space, but an empty space, devoid of stereotypes, of bias, of misconceptions. If you grew up always hearing from your mother, never trust a man in your entire life. And I sometimes agree with your mother. But sometimes you never allow yourself the opportunity to trust a man in your life. Or if you heard from your father growing up, his opinion about Jewish women, and you just bring that into your marriage, all the toxicity, all the negative energy. Do we have the courage to carve out an empty space in our heart, in our psyche, and actually be able to listen, actually be able to absorb actually be able to learn something new about your spouse, about yourself, about your child, about your God, about your friend, about the world, about truth. We enter into conversations supposedly open-minded, but is our cup empty 
Or is our cup absolutely full? The Sfasemes, the Maharal, Reb Chaim Valozhin, the Nefesh Chaim, the Balatanya, all brilliantly analyze the two words many of you have heard growing up, but with the wrong translation. Or I should say, not with the full translation. You remember Chilul Hashem. What does Chilul Hashem mean? Desecration of God. But Chilul really comes from another word. It comes from the word halal, an empty space. Chilul Shabbat is not just the violation of Shabbat, it's an empty space. What does this mean? Chilul Hashem means when I believe that there are spaces that are empty of the presence of God. There are spaces in which God's intimacy is not to be found. And therefore I replace, I fill those spaces with what? with insecurity, with fear, with hate, with resentment, with judgmentalism, with bias, with arrogance, with narcissism. You know why? Because I don't realize that that space is actually full with God reaching out to me and saying, be open to my life energy right now. I am here right now in this conversation, in this encounter, in this moment. Don't make any spoil space devoid of me because it's going to be replaced with toxicity that will not actually allow you to experience any moment. I have to tell you, one of the most disturbing, fascinating, and beautiful Talmudic stories. I saw it the first time, I was like, this is quite interesting. Jerusalem Talmud, Tractate Peah. Chapter 8, Section 8. Remember that. Okay? Jerusalem Talmud, Tractate Peya, 8 8. So somebody will ask you, so what do you learn today at Sinai? You'll say, Yerushalmi, Peya, Perik Ches, Halacha Ches. 8 8. You heard before from Rabbi Lef about 8. Chaver. Here's the story Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish went to take a Schwitz. You know where they used to go for the Schwitz? Chameitveria. You ever went to the hot baths in Tiberias? Kishmak? You forgot? You go to Tveria, you check out Chameitveria, the hot baths, the springs, hot natural springs from Tiberias. They went to bathe there. And you know, outside every attraction in Israel, who stands? Somebody collecting money. Right? They call them in Yiddish a schnorrer which really means a guy who has a PhD in fundraising from Harvard University. There's a guy standing there, turns to Rabbi Lakish, who were they? Third century, greatest sages of the time. Rabbi Yochanan is the editor of Talmud Yerushalmi. He's the editor of Jerusalem Talmud. His brother-in-law was Rish Lakish. How they met is a fantastic story, but it's not for now. They're going to the bathe. This poor man turns to them and he says, Tzedakah, tzedakah, charity, charity, I want money. What do they say? They say, we have an appointment in the hot bath. We're going to go. We'll bathe. We'll come out and we'll give you money. They do that. When they come out, you know what they see? The man is dead. He died. He was starving and he died. I don't know if it was an hour later, two hours later, he was gone. What would you do at that moment, honestly? What would every Jew feel at that moment? Give me the emotion. It's called the greatest, holiest Jewish emotion. What is it? Guilt. We have jury duty in New York. So I know a Jewish woman, she was exempt from jury duty because she told the judge that she was guilty. <laughs> the definition of a Jew is if he doesn't feel guilty, he blames himself. How do you know a Jew when he makes a fist? The next thing is, Guilt, right? Guilt. I just killed this guy. I just killed this guy. And for the next 22 years, would you not be in therapy? Telling them what a horrible monster you are? You'll become a dysfunctional, guilty Jew because you killed a person indirectly. You know what they did? They turned to each other, listened to their words. I'm going to translate them in English. They said, we did not have the privilege to honor him during his lifetime. 
let us have the schus, the privilege, to honor him in his death. He needs somebody to take care of him. They took his body to cleanse it, to put it in the mikveh, to do the tahara, to cover it in shrouds, and to bury it in a dignified Jewish burial and to say the Kaddish. We didn't have the privilege to help him in his lifetime. Let's help him in his death. They took the body, and you know what happened? They undressed him. And you know what they found in his bosom right here? You know what they found? 400 golden coins. He was sick. His stinginess killed him. They did not kill him. Wow. Empty space. Living in the now. They felt they might have killed a Jew. Do they have to repent? Yes. But you know what their primary emotion was? What is my responsibility right now? How many of us never live in the now? We wallow in the guilt of yesterday and yesteryear. Decisions we made 20, 30, 50, 70 years ago. And we're still living in the past, anxious, tormented, broken, or worried about the future. In the classic Jewish telegram from the Baba that comes from Johannesburg to New York, start worrying details to follow. And you know what happens? I'm so filled with negative energy. I'm so filled with resentment, with regret. I cannot carve out a space to feel God's energy which is creating me right now. Because creation is perpetual. Creation happens now. Relationships happen now. Life happens now. Learn from the past. Prepare for the future. But live now. You can't. I can't. Rabbi Yochanan and Rishlakish, wow! They thought they killed somebody. They didn't know the truth. But you know what? They said to themselves, do we have to do tshuva? Of course. They may have to repent for 20, 30, 60 years. Maybe. But right now, the man has to be buried. You can't ignore him because you're obsessed with your guilt. Be there for him. He needs a burial. You didn't have the schus. To be him in life, to be there for a lifetime, at least in death. And here is the great magic of the story. When you live that way, you know what you discover? That you actually don't have to blame yourself. So often you discover you are living in your own toxic delusions. They open up his clothes and they find that they never killed him. The poor man killed himself. He was dysfunctional. He was nebach ill. He had hundreds, thousands of dollars, not rand. May it go up higher and higher and higher, Bakarov, with the help of your president. You find out this guy was filthy rich. The guy killed himself. Don't make a chalal of God. Hashem is here now in me, in this moment, in this experience. Open yourself up. What does God want from me now? And then you will see that life could be experienced on a different level. Like a symphony. Every moment is a note. Play that note to the fullest. Carpe diem. Suck, your ma suck the marrow out of life. Out of the now, who is the most important person you'll meet? The person you're meeting right now. And what is the most important moment in your life? The moment you are experiencing right now. When you say good evening to your child, don't text, don't check your phone. That is the most important meeting you will ever have in your life. Because that's where creation is happening. That's where the flow is going on. Friends, I think I have to go to the gym. <laughs> Will you give me a hagba next time? Because this time I got shishi. <laughs>